He was Brian Murphy and some white supremacist, uh, white privilege, Southern general. Most of them by which to, I didn't realize it. His brother, I knew his senior, his brother was chief of naval operations. Oh, really? Father Richardson's brother. His, his grandfather was an Army World War II logistician. This is Clark's right hand man in, in World War II. And I think his father was Navy. I don't think he was a captain in the military, but his brother was the chief of naval operations. That whole family is great. I've never, I've never met anybody as quite as great as funny. Father Gould called him his prodigy priest. <laughs> no, child, child prodigy priest. That's what he called him. It's so sad that he got MS and all those complications, and he, he was so handicapped. He's and he's so really hard. He was here. And, we, and he might have some, he suggested we do a retreat. And I might be able to, maybe in the spring, we could do one right here. And come over if we could physically do it. I remember we went up to the mountains. And he was passed up there and he had all this day planned, all the activities. And we sat down and he started talking. And he stopped on lunch. <laughs> He's amazing, but he's so smart. Yeah. He's done. He's repaired. As far as he's repaired, he has his He took the car. He took the Volkswagen and put a, I don't know, Dodge engine. And he, he gave it to a nurse out in the southern part of the country, the desert. And she was nursing a woman who had. Serious complications at birth. And they put her in that car and went over 100 miles an hour across the desert. And the police found out what's going on. And they radioed ahead and said, There's a bull fight coming in 100 miles an hour. Let it go. But they, he just did just, just, yeah, like, hey, this uh, turning to new fields of knowledge. When he was, when he was, after he graduated seminary, he went to Mount St. Mary's to visit a friend and they were doing the MedCap, which is the free medical school entrance exam. He took it for fun and passed it. And they called and said, would you become one medical school? He went to the and he said, no. Yes. He did the MedCap for fun. He just didn't have anything to do for an hour. So he said, I'll just take this thing. <laughs> Then we had doctors. Oh, doctors. my gosh. He, his, he said when he was a teenager, his father asked him to limit his hobbies to 50. 50. <laughs> yeah, he could do everything astronomy. He played games. He built model airplanes. He could play like five instruments musically. No, I just I, I don't even know. Anyway, oh, we got to get started. It's late. Got to start. It's all right. We have. Yeah. Yeah. In the name of the Father and the Son. In the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done. As it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Come, Holy Spirit, the hearts of the faithful and kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. How do we instruct the hearts of the faithful? By the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by that same spirit to have right judgment in all things. Never rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, good morning. Yes, please, go ahead, make an announcement. Um, 
So as many of you know, yeah. the Christians of the College Chapel is nearing conclusion. The dedication will be uh, April 15th. Uh, we were out there on Friday, and um, I talked to um, the gal who uh, you know, orchestrated our visit the last time to Elizabeth Ellis in Mount San Antonio. And uh, asked if we could have a, another a visit uh, from the Bible study after the dedication, uh, sort of like we see before and after. And uh, she said yes, that they would put together something for us if we had interest. So I will post a, uh, an email uh, through Rob's Bible study distribution. Of soliciting interest for anybody interested sometime after April the 15th and before the end of class, which is in May. Um, we'll orchestrate a, um, a visit out there again. Very similar thing. We'll have mass, hopefully, in the new chapel. And, um, and then a uh, lunch and presentation for uh, a tour. Um, and I think you'll see that it's pretty spectacular. So, uh, look for the email to come from sure. Rob. Okay, thank you. Um, we haven't seen it since the time we went up last time, and I'll tell you, I think it's going to be a, a, a very important um, place for people to go to, to see. I think it's going to be one of the most beautiful churches in the region. They have just about incorporated everything Catholic in it that you can think of, <laughs> but it's just truly amazing there, the, the beauty of that church, and they're, they they raised $40 million to build the building and raised it and got it. They're putting most likely over $100,000 in artwork. Uh, the windows, the... Um, more than 100000 Yeah, probably more than 100000 And um, Each of their paintings, Oh, well, I mean, yeah, but some, some, I don't know what was paid for, what wasn't. That may, some of it may have been part of them. But anyway, it, it's going to be, they, they've spared no expense to make this a, a truly gorgeous place to go and worship uh, our Lord and King. And you can see it from the highway. It's truly amazing. It's, it's, it's just, you just wonder why would there be a, a cathedral from, you know, 1850 standing in the middle of <laughs> that field over there. It's just like, but anyway, um, I just want to welcome a guest. Renee is visiting, but Renee is not a guest. She's a returning member. She went away in the military, took her away and brought her back. And so we're really happy to have you, Renee. Welcome to, uh, to this morning's Bible study. Long time member before. Um, yes. Oh, yes. Tom. Welcome. Welcome this morning. Um, just a reminder, uh, since I almost completely forgot the Christmas break, um, I mean, the, the, the Thanksgiving break, I decided to post it early. Uh, we will meet one more time, which is next um, Tuesday, and then we'll be off for two weeks for a Christmas and New Year's holidays. Um, if luck has it, we'll finish the fourth chapter that we've been on since the year began. So we've just been going so fast. Um, We'll finish the second chapter of Luke, and then we'll go and look at Mark very briefly, and then we'll start the detailed study of Matthew, which will take us a little while, but we'll go, uh, Father Sebastian selected Matthew as the model for the synoptics. Uh, Father Do Do Dr. Um, Tim Gray had selected Mark for his, so you can only do the synoptics by taking one and going into detail, and then at the end showing you the similarities and differences uh, with the others, but um, Matthew is phenomenal. So that's what we'll be doing. Uh, last week we looked at, um, we were still in chapter one of Luke, and we saw Mary's Magnificat, which I mentioned is read every single night in the Liturgy of the Hours. It's just an amazing factor at how many of these events that are happening here in Luke's Gospel are part of the Liturgy of the Hours, which, as I said, all the clergy in the entire world read every day or pray every day. And so we saw that, and we saw how Luke had compared or brought to us the great story of Hannah, the mother of Samuel in the Old Testament, who was the prophet that anointed David. So all this linkage. I mean, if you think, if you think there's just coincidences in the Bible, it's, it's, it, it doesn't make sense. You just see the hand of God in all of it. There's no way 
a bunch of people could have gotten together and come up with this story. Uh, it's obviously the hand of God as we see uh, Hannah's role and her proclamation. She was a barren woman. Her husband had another wife with children. She was humiliated and, and frustrated and finally went to pray when they went on a pilgrimage. And Eli, the priest, heard her, thought she was drunk. And she said, no, I'm just praying for a son. And he said, you'll have a son. And then she had a son. And she dedicated her son to the temple and, well, tent of the meeting. So she gave her son once he was weaned to the tent of the meeting. And that was the growing up of Samuel, the great Old Testament prophet. Then we saw the, the role of John the Baptist and how Zechariah, uh, who was struck mute for his refusal to trust in God's divine providence and his capability, uh, was finally able to speak again at the conclusion of right after the, the birth of his son, John. And he gave another amazing proclamation, which is read every morning in morning prayer in the liturgy hours, which is just awesome. And his proclamation talks about his son being what we hear in mass almost every, every day these last few weeks since uh, Advent of the coming of the Lord and one going into the wilderness proclaiming the coming of the Messiah and John filled that role. And he was the last prophet. And he was, as Jesus said, the greatest prophet. And he was also the hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So he was really an Old Testament prophet at the beginning of the New Testament. And he was there to proclaim uh, the coming of the Messiah. Then we turn to Luke 2 and started off by getting this little history lesson about who was the emperor that called for this requirement for everybody to go back to their um, ancestral village, and then who was the governor. And we, we saw how some of the modern Bible scholars said, oh, he wasn't really the governor, so Luke made all this stuff up. It's not true. But uh, it turned out uh, Quirinius was basically the administrator, which same thing as the governor. And it was, in fact, been proven through archaeology that he was there and that that statement was true. I, maybe in a touch of all subject, you were raised as a Methodist. Ray, I was raised as a Methodist, yeah. and I was going to a Baptist school, and I was confirmed an Episcopalian, and I married this wonderful Catholic so woman. Whole... I'm, I'm there. I'm covered. I'm covered. Whoever, yeah. don't worry. In this class, you've been emphasizing that the New Testament showed show how. Jesus was the hinge between the Old Testament. And the, uh, he was a fulfillment, Protestant. fulfillment of the Old Testament. Yes. Was that is that brought up in the, the Protestant things where they're because they're studying the Bible, they quote the Bible all the time. Right. I don't know that they know what they're quoting. Well, they they know, but there's a lot of biblical scholarship, uh, probably more biblical scholarship coming from the Protestant side, and they were leading in biblical scholarship. Right. We've been about twenty years behind in our scholarship, but for the most part. The way I was raised from my grandfather, who, who wasn't a scholar, um, it's the idea that I can read the Bible in English. It was written in English. It was written to me. And I know what it says because I can read the words. And so I want to know what Jesus wants me to do. So it's what does Jesus want me to do? I go to church every Sunday, beautiful hymns, lots of great prayers. But I want to hear a message about what would Jesus do? How do I live like Jesus? How do I make my life? What's going on politically and all that stuff? Well, what would Jesus do about that? So it was always Jesus and me. Uh, I don't remember ever having theology. I was sharing this last night with the RCIA, how we have so much theology that goes all the way back, which is the study of God, which is basically to take the scriptures and clarify these dogmas. One of the Protestants last month said, we never had dogmas. What is a dogma? You know, it's a fundamental teaching we believe that, it, that is infallible. And it was given to us by God. And we, we have dogmas and, and they're all based on scripture. And everything that's in our faith comes from either <coughs> scripture or the, or the sacred tradition, which were things not written in the Bible that came to us from the apostles. So everything that we our faith is based on is from the apostolic times forward. So I don't think that that as a Protestant, I ever had any of that at all and and was only looking for, for Jesus and me. Um, when you look at the Bible, you we used to study the Old Testament as the wonderful stories of David and 
and Moses and all those great figures. My grandfather often talked about the Old Testament, but it really wasn't as much oriented theologically towards being fulfilled with Jesus. I think there was some of that presented, but not, not to the level that we're doing in biblical scholarship here. Good. You're welcome. Okay, all right, next two weeks, we'll meet next week and then we'll be off. Uh, all right. We are already in chapter two, um, verse eight of this wonderful story. And I want you to keep in mind, I, I, I hope I'll have time to do it, if not this week, next week, to, to, after we get through Luke 2, it's really interesting to see what's in Matthew and what's in Luke. And how does the whole story unfold? You know, because Matthew just gives us a little snippet up here, boom, we're in Bethlehem, the baby's born. Luke goes back and tells us about John, John the Baptist and Zechariah and all. It's really amazing that the entire story obviously requires both, both um, versions. All right, verse eight. And well, last week we looked at Caesar Augustine and all that sort of thing. And then we look at, at um, going to Bethlehem and what happened at Bethlehem. And then we saw the firstborn son, and we talked about the fact the firstborn son simply meant the one that opened the womb. The first male that opened the womb in accordance with the law was required to be redeemed. And we'll look at that again a little bit in a minute. And so we saw that. And then we saw uh, the idea that he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, um, which is what they wrap babies in. But also it gives us that image of being bound, this little infant being bound, completely wound with cloth, for warmth and for health and protection and then at the end of his life he'll be wrapped in the shroud which is a burial cloth and you have that image jesus came to be born to die and as i said in the eastern church we have a christmas card where the baby jesus is not in a manger he's in a coffin it's just truly amazing okay verse 80 said in that region there were shepherds well there's still shepherds in that region i can tell you <laughs> they're bedouins um yeah, they're out there and they're living in their tents and their Mercedes parked out front and their <laughs> satellite dishes in front of the tent. It's truly amazing. It's a, but there are Bedouins out there and, and some of them, we went there a couple, a couple of times that were very, very poor, but they were very proud people. I remember them inviting us not only into their little camp, but into their house and show us their one, one room tent and how the mats are rolled up during the day and pushed against the wall, but then they're unrolled at night and they eat in the same room cooking. It was truly amazing to how, see how these people lived. And of course, they were in the middle of the dead gum desert and they had these sheep that were grazing off of, I've told you before, I, I think it looked like steel wool. I don't know what the heck it was. There was no grass, but they had all this flock of sheep and they were out there grazing and, and they were just amazing, wonderful, friendly people, except the children had all been taught to ask for money. They surrounded you and asked for money. It was really typical. Okay, so the shepherds were there and they were in the field and this, this field is less than a mile from Bethlehem. Today, when you go to the shepherd's field, it's still a field, it's still open, there's still sheep in it and there are caves everywhere. And the caves in some of them are somewhat deep and most likely the shepherds would have slept in the caves with the sheep probably surrounding the outside. But you can look across that field and see the modern town of Bethlehem. So in my image, there would have been a smaller town and then on the outskirts of a town, a cave. And that was the cave that the animals for the people spending the night in the inn would, would be housed and fed like a livery stable in the Old West. In my image, when Jesus is born, there's a light that comes out of a supernatural light. That's just me speaking. I mean, it doesn't say that in the Bible. But the shepherds could see something over there after the angel told them, that attracted them to go and see the baby. So that's what we'll see in the story. So he said they were in the field keeping watch over their sheep by night and the angel of the Lord, and think of how many times we've seen an angel in Luke's gospel. We, we have an angel, Zachariah sees an angel in the temple, it talks to him. Mary sees an angel when she's uh, invited to become the mother of God. Joseph sees an angel in a dream twice to marry his wife and go to Egypt. The shepherds see an angel, and this is followed by a host, an angelic host. So angels, which appear rarely in the Old Testament, and when they do, you're scared to death because they always killed a lot of people, uh, are everywhere in this wonderful story of the birth of Jesus. Obviously, the resurrection was not thought after death. Probably not. Probably, yeah. probably something came later. 
So the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with fear. Again, why? Because angels scare you. So here we are, same reason the Bedouins. And um, we, we know, as I just said, the fear that would come as a result of that. Verse nine, he says, and uh, I'm sorry, verse nine, we already, verse yeah, 10 and 11. Um, and then the angel said to them, be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. That's evangelion. That's the announcement of the victory in battle. I bring you good news and great joy, which will come to all people. These are very significant words because this is implying this message will go out universally, which it does. But initially, we're talking to, to Jewish people who are the chosen people who are a very closed community within their faith. But he said, it'll go out to all people, for to you is born this day in the city of David, right across the plain there, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Remember, Christ is, means the Christ, uh, the Messiah means the anointed one. And the people that were anointed at this level were kings. So they're basically saying, the film in 2 Samuel 7, a king of the line of David, is what's being born here. And this is what the significance of this is. They've been waiting 500 years for this king to come back to Jerusalem. So once again, uh, the angel tells Mary not to be afraid. And he, they mention savior. Savior in the Old Testament was a reference to the king. It was his job to save the people from the enemies roundabout. You see David doing this, the successful king and all the 20 kings of the South, 20 kings of the North was one who could provide security and peace from enemies roundabout. They were fighting all the time. And there was always someone attacking somebody else. But the good kings were the ones that had the blessings of God to save them. So the word savior can be seen as another title for the king. So Jesus, the king, the savior being born in Bethlehem. And then there's the word kyrios, which we say at mass three times. It's wonderful. It's a Greek word. That's probably the oldest phrase in the liturgy because it does go back to the Greek and it's older than the Latin. It's amazing how this is all part of our liturgy. It's amazing. But kyrios means master. You know, the guy that's above you, the guy that's in charge. So that's another image of the king. Um, Father reminded us of something. I think I've talked to you about it before. Maybe not. As, as history evolved, and as we got into more modern biblical scholarship times, the Greek language had gone through a series of different iterations and changes. And modern Greek continued on to where it is today. The biblical Greek is not modern Greek. They're, they're not that similar. I mean, they're Greek, but they're the letters. Are, but there's a great difference between biblical Greek and modern Greek. So the early scholars nicknamed it Holy Ghost Greek. They didn't know what it was. And then in archaeology, when they started finding parchments and things of that era, they found out that what we call biblical Greek was the Greek of that period. It was the Greek that was being spoken in a nation whose primary language had been Hebrew, but whose major language was Aramaic. So, you, you know, we don't speak the king's English anymore. None of us do. And we think they're foreign. You know, <laughs> they don't speak English. That's, but as English has changed, it's modified in America because of our heritage and our background and the way we speak and all our idioms and that sort of thing. So think of Greek going through the same thing. It's now the language of the people who needed to speak Greek, but it was modified from the high Greek and it was truly different. So when we study uh, biblical Greek, it is a, it's really a different language. It's, it's truly amazing. But it is the language that they were speaking at the time. Now, interestingly, Father pointed out that where you get the greatest source for New Testament Greek is from the, the Septuagint. Now remember, the scrolls originally were all in Hebrew. Eventually, a few of them later on, Maccabee period, that sort of thing, were written in, in that Greek. 
But for the most part, the Jews at that time, time didn't speak Hebrew anymore, couldn't read Hebrew anymore. The rabbis could, they did all their memorization, that sort of thing, but they could not use Hebrew. And they went to the, about 300 years before Christ, they went to the rabbis and said, give this to us in our language. So they had either 70 scholars or 70 years, I don't know what, but 70, Septuagint is 70 or seven. And they produced a Greek version of the scriptures 300 years before Christ. And that's the Old Testament. So biblical scholars, when they run across a Greek word in the New Testament, try to see how that Greek word was used in the Old Testament in the Septuagint. Now, I never got, I've taken Greek three times and I'm hopeless. But, but Father Sebastian is very fluent in that. And, and it's really wonderful to be able to see how these words that we, we read in English all the time as though they were written yesterday, but how they had this Greek meaning that goes all the way back to the translation of the Hebrew into Greek. So it's it's just an amazing thing. So we most scholars today say the first place we look to find the meaning of a particular word in, in the New Testament is in the Septuagint. For instance, the word Kyrios means Lord, and it was used in substitution in the Septuagint for Yahweh. Why? Because about that time, the, the thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain became so pronounced that a Jew could not say the name, the holy name of God. It was forbidden. The only person that could say, I've told you this before, the holy name of God was the high priest and only on Yom Kippur and only in the Holy of Holies where he got to go in and sprinkle blood of a lamb, sacrificial lamb around where the Ark of the Covenant used to be, but wasn't since the temple are destroyed by the Babylonians, but they would go in there once a year. And in that environment, the high priest could say Yahweh, but no one else could. When you're writing it, if you had to write it, you had to use special ink and a special pen, and they had to be destroyed after you used, wrote the word. I mean, this was really important to the Jew. That's why when you get to Matthew's gospel, Matthew does not say kingdom of God. What does he say? Kingdom of heaven. What do we, particularly us Protestant before, say? Oh, that's about heaven. That's about pie in the sky. Oh, he's talking about the kingdom in the pie. No, he was talking about the kingdom of Israel. He was talking about the new kingdom. He was talking about the kingdom of David. He was talking about what Luke and Mark called the kingdom of God, which is the church. But he used kingdom of heaven because he didn't want to relate that close to the holy name, God, and so he didn't use it. But we don't know that if you just read it in English as though it was written to you yesterday. And that's where we get all these, all these confusions. Even called it Shem, which just means the name. Yeah, yeah. So it's truly amazing that, that this uh, whole language thing came about. And that's why in our English Bibles, the translator respecting the Septuagint put the word LORD in all caps. So you probably wonder why in your Bible study you see the Lord God and the kill. It's because they're referring to the holy name that was called uh, Kyrios in that. So it's just a fascinating aside. It'll be on the exam, so you might as well write that down. Answer. Okay. Again, when we look at these words, we need, I mentioned that, Kyrios. And they said that Luke was trying to give us a hint that this was not just an ordinary king that's being bored over there in that cave with the shepherds. This was, this was a divine king. And this is very, very important. Now, the Jewish people believed that, that God was in, that the, in the king of Israel, uh, uh, God was incarnate. There were, he was the divine king, if you will, like the, the what was it? England had the divine right of kings with, that God gave them the right and they ruled for God and that sort of thing. That, that was their peace. Now, but you would think that this person who had given this title would be the high priest because the high priest was the mediator between the people and God. He was their representative. Why wouldn't it be the high priest? But Father pointed out in the New Testament, uh, it, was the, it was the king who received this true title and true power. And we've seen in the New Testament, we have a human king who will be, was Jesus, but he was also divine. That's why we say fully human, fully divine, like us in all things with sin, but fully divine. A divine will and a human will. All of this is possible in the divine human person conceived in the womb of Mary, outside the normal way, born in Bethlehem 
at Christmas. So this is why it's so important for us to understand this meaning of Messiah or Christ as the anointed king. Okay, verse 12. He said, and this will, this will be a sign for you. He's talking to the, to the shepherds. He said, this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. What's a manger? I think we all know. A manger is a food trough for an animal. If you have a barn, you, you many of you see modern things. There, when you, when you see cattle that are brought into to a barn in the winter and that sort of thing, there's big troughs there for them. So normally it's a small trough. And in in the church of the nativity in Bethlehem, uh, you have the the altar the normal Greek Orthodox altar. And the church looks just like a normal church, but there's a passage that goes around behind the altar and down these stairs. And at the bottom of the stairs, as I said, is a flat place and a, a glass that you can look down into the cave, into the whole, the, the dirt floor of the cave where Jesus was born. But right next to that is an all cemented square rectangle, which is the location they believe of the manger. So it would have been most likely a wooden box filled with hay for the animals to come and eat. And that was the only comfortable place rather than putting Jesus on the hard floor or whether they had a cloak or I don't, I don't know if they had blankets. I know they had cloaks. Uh, Lame on that, they, he's, he's resting in after being in the arms of his mother, he would be placed in this food trough. And that's what we're seeing. Volumes for the blessed mother. It does not get caught up in legalism yeah. just to raise her child as God needed. Yeah, and she is she really the, the whole thing again, you asking about Protestantism. The one of the hardest things for me to learn to accept was the veneration of Mary, because in English it says they'll have an it was implied they had other children, you know, this firstborn and he's their second born. <laughs> And, and all of these things after he didn't have relation to until after the birth and all those things we looked at, uh, we as Catholics have always maintained that she was always a virgin. There's an explanation in those words in their original language don't mean what they mean in English. So again, the confusion, but we see this uh, happening and said, um, for, for behold, it's good news. I will bring good news to the great joy. No, I'm sorry. Um, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. So these guys are out in the field. They're looking over there. Suddenly they have this arrival of an angel talking to them. And then there's a whole host of angels. And obviously it's where we get the joyful music. And we would, would imagine that the light would be awesome. And, and just it would just be an unbelievable moment. Now, I've told many of this before. And I haven't gotten any further than I was when I talked to you about it before, because I spent so much time doing this, but I have an image. I, I would really like to write a book that would have this premise. And I, I would use it to explain all these unique things about biblical study that, that are so unique. And I really hope I have a chance to do this, but my image was that, that there was a, a young boy like David, who was raising his family sheep in that field with the professional shepherds. And in my image, they go over to explore this light and see this phenomenon. And the baby goes, the young boy goes with him. He's about 12. When they get there in my image, I promise you this is not biblical. In my image, Mary does, they probably brought something. They probably brought cheese. They probably brought milk. They probably brought, probably had some goat milk in that. And they offered that to the child. And Mary, having nothing, probably had the only thing she could offer them. And that is, would you like to hold the baby? How many of you have ever visited a new mom? And that's what she offered. Would you like to hold the baby? Well, most guys like me say, oh, no, I drop him. I'm sure I don't want to. But but most women want to hold the baby. But my image is these rough shepherds say, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. But the little boy, the young 12 year old has a brother, a baby brother, a, a little bit older than birth that he's comfortable with. And he said, yes, I'd like to hold the baby. And so Mary puts the baby in this boy's arms. And this is the part that I want to develop. The baby looks in the eyes of, 
I mean, the boy looks in the eyes of Jesus and Jesus looks in his eyes and there's a recognition. That's the end of it. He goes back. We've had this joyful moment. And then his brother's killed by Herod, his baby brother. My story is hard. <laughs> so then I want to fast forward to these up. And then I can tell the entire three years of Jesus' ministry in and around Jerusalem through the eyes of this boy who grows into a man. And finally, the last scene is this now man looking in the eyes of Jesus on the cross and their eyes meet again and there's recognition. If I could ever write it, <laughs> I'd be happy to, but I don't know if I ever get time. But that's my Christmas image, this idea of, of holding the baby Jesus, this idea of wanting to, to really hold in a way God. Anyway, that's a side. That's not. That sounds biblical. like what a Raymond Arroyo was doing. Oh, yeah, Raymond Arroyo. He's coming up, making up all this stuff. <laughs> okay, no, it's true. It's good stuff. So, uh, yeah, I should. I will. If, if somebody could teach the Bible study, I'd dedicate time to doing that. But I, I got too much to teach. There's too much. Okay, so there we are. We're not going to get any work again this morning. So, Father suggested something else going on here. Um, about wrapping and swaddling clothes. We talked about it briefly last week. It comes out of Wisdom 7, which is the story of Solomon, who was trying to attest to his followers how ordinary he was. Yeah, right. You're ordinary. You're David's son, and you're inherited the richest nation on the world, and you're going to have the even more powerful nation. But he wants to let everybody know that I, like every other baby, when I was born, I wasn't, I was born in a palace, but I was wrapped in swaddling clothes. So the image here is. Jesus, the king, not born in a palace, is wrapped in swaddling clothes. So we saw that last time. Um, we also sing at Christmas all these one, wonderful songs about peace and goodwill among men. Peace, Hachem. It, it's a beautiful thought, but it's not the absence of war. Most of us, particularly military, think of peace as the absence of war. But the peace of Christ, the peace he gave to his apostles after the resurrection, my peace I give you, when he blew on them the Holy Spirit. That peace is the peace of tranquility, and that is the peace of righteousness. A righteous person is a person who obeyed the law. Righteousness in the Old Testament was fully complying with the law. So you really can't have peace if you're not righteous. So that's what we're seeing here in Luke. Okay, 15 through... Uh, right. When the angels uh, went away from them to into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made, when they saw it, they made known uh, sayings, which has been told them concerning the child and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. We see that later again, how it says she kept all of these things in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So, Father pointed out that, again, it says Lord, not Yahweh, even though this is about God. And Mary and Joseph are doing these things in accordance to Leviticus. and. The circumcision and the purification both come from the Levit Leviticus 12. So it's basically Leviticus 12, 1 through 6. Now, what is Leviticus? Genesis is creation. The creation story, the first 12 cha chapters are about the prehistory, the flood, the starting over with Noah, Tower of Babel, and all that. But then chapter 13 on, we have Abraham and the story going forward. You get them through that book of Genesis into Egypt, where they stay 430 years. Exodus picks up with them in captivity, bondage in Egypt, and moves forward. The story goes all the way through Exodus. But then in Exodus, we get the law. The, the, no, I'm sorry. The law is all five first books. So in Leviticus, after you've been given the tent of the meeting and how to worship and all the things, you get all the rituals. So Leviticus, being your Levitical priesthood, these are the instructions for them on how to make sacrifice and what people are supposed to do. Now, I've shared this with you before, and I won't pass it around again. But what the 
what was in existence is someone went through all five books and listed every one of the commandments of God, do this or don't do that. And there were 248 positive commands. And there were 365 negative commands. That comes to 613 rules and regulations. This is the law. This is what every good Jew was supposed to know. This is what every good Jew was supposed to practice. Just think about that. If we had to keep track of 613 rules about the mass, I mean, it would, it's mind boggling. But when you look at that, you find something like this. Leviticus is saying, the Lord said to Moses, this again, part of the law, say to the people of Israel, if a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. Another aside real quickly. Ancient paganism had a real fear of blood, particularly a woman bleeding. It, it, they, they even thought it was so bad that if a woman bled, they would contaminate the soil. They couldn't even, they couldn't even uh, use it for, for growing things because it was contaminated. The big thing in the Bible about blood is the fact that on the other extreme, the pagans believed that if they drank the blood of an animal, they would gain the animal strength. So there was a tendency for people, an animal died or an animal was killed, to drink the blood. So that's why all these rules came about, about not able, not uh, killing an animal except in front of a priest. So you had to take your animal to the priest and slay him ritually. And what was the ritual? It was to slit their throat and let all the pour, blood pour out. Blood was seen as the life force of the animal. That's why the pagans drink it. So the Jews, to avoid that, God forbid them to do all these things. That's where kosher comes from. Kosher is not because, you know, it's not healthy. And as I mentioned before, the ban on eating pork was because pork was the only animal in Egypt that wasn't a god. And that's what everybody ate all the time. So their pork was the, the main meat substance in Egypt. So when they pulled out, God said to them, oh, by the way, every day, You've got to offer a lamb in sacrifice, which was a deity in Egypt, which means you're committing deicide twice a day. And you can't eat any of the meat that, that they would eat. So you're going to be eating meat that would be considered a god in Egypt. So it was really a, a burning the bridge type of commandment to prevent them from ever going back to Egypt. They complained about it every day. Yeah, thank God we can eat pork now. But that, that was the, the reason for all this. So here he's getting this law and he said, They'll be unclean for seven days in the time of menstruation, and she shall be unclean. And then on the eighth day, the flesh of the foreskin shall be circumcised. This is the, the, the son. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purification, and she shall not touch anything hallowed, nor come into the sanctuary until the day of purification are completed. That's why that woman that hemorrhaged for 12 years could never go in the temple. Nobody that had any infirmity could go into the temple. That's why the people who had deformities could go in the temple. And he said, the, and until the day of her purification is completed. So that's the, that's the law that Mary and Joseph are complying with when they circumcise Jesus on the eighth day. And that's the day that he's named. And then she goes for the purification. And the law also tells them in Exodus uh, 13, 2, to offer the first son um, to God. So Exodus 13. I'm sorry. What have I got there? Ex Exodus 13, 2. Yes. Yeah. All right. Why can't I find this thing? I got it too organized. All right. Exodus 13. I'm going to read one verse. Can you believe this? All right. He said, the Lord, this is Exodus 13, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all firstborn. For these firstborn to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and beast are mine. So the, these young couple with their first child are doing everything in accordance with the law. Eight days. 40 days. Why 40 days? It came up at 32 and so on. But the real reason is 40 is a big number. Floods, 40 days, 40 days in the wilderness, all this sort of thing. 
So that's a big Jewish number anyway. So this is what they're doing. Now, Father also pointed out Jerusalem is about six miles from Bethlehem. And, and that means most likely they stayed in Bethlehem for at least 40 days before they went anywhere else. Father, the purification for the woman was 40 days? After 40 days, the purification, yes. Right. And yet the, the firstborn babe, firstborn male had to be dedicated. Right. After eight days. No, eight days was was his naming. He was circumcised. That was the mark of Abraham. The circumcision done in the temple. But what no, no, the circumcision wasn't done in the temple. The circumcision could be done by the rabbi and still is. But you went to the temple after 40 days for the purification. And for what I, I tried to find that out because I believe that this is when he was offered as well. But it was the same sacrifice. And again, the law permitted a person who was poor because the, the rule was a lamb. Lamb is very expensive. A poor person could offer two turtle doves. It appears that in offering this offering to, re, to, to, to give the son to God and the purification of Mary both occurred after 40 days in the temple. I, I couldn't find where it said you could do the boy after 40 days, but I'm sure it's there. Yeah, it's, okay, so that yeah. Hollywood is screwed up. Probably, most likely. Yeah. There's, there's still allegedly, I never had it done for me. I'm still in captivity if I were in the Old Testament. But there's a, a ceremony that you ransom that first child back for a certain sum of right. money. Right. And I think that's the, well, the ransoming is back is the offering. Yeah. Okay, verse 23. Oh, wait a minute. That's. Okay. Um, so he said in verse 23, he said, um, as is written in the law of the Lord, every well, we just read that. So we're finished at 23. So there's the next one. So Again, an interesting term here. We see it say Lord, Lord, all often in the Bible. And you see two being very predominant in many things. But Father said, Lord, Lord, here is a circumlocution. I don't give the definition. A circumlocution is the use of many words where fewer words would do especially in a deliberate attempt to be vague or elusive. So I, I understand Lord, Lord, but what I also have seen from Old Testament biblical study is that the Jews don't have any adjectives to describe something as really great. So they repeat it, holy, holy, or if it's really great, it's holy, holy, holy. And I think this is more of a repetitive to emphasize the holiness of the Lord or the lordship of the Lord rather than a circumlocution. But it just means he is the Christ. He's our master. He's the king who's to come. And again, Father pointed out, Luke was really pointing to something beyond these passages. And again, we're going to see this offering of a pair of turtle doves. And again, that was permitted in, in Leviticus uh, 5, chapter uh, verse 7. And then verse 26, it goes on and he says, and it had been revealed to him uh, by the Holy Spirit that he should not, oh, wait a minute, we're down. Did we miss how we got there? Let's go back. 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon. And this man was righteous, there again, complying with the law completely and devout, looking for consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So we have this coming. Now, uh, according to scripture, some scholars see him as just an ordinary guy, a righteous man. Others, like St. Ephraim, believe that he was a priest. And Father said, in some children's Bibles, you'll see Simeon dressed in the robes of a priest. And we're just not too sure. 26 um, says, that, and he had been revealed to him. All right, we just read that. So 26, he said, the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon. And this is where we get another statement from Luke's gospel that's ready, read 
every day in the Liturgy of the Hours. This one's read with uh, night prayer. And every night of the year, we hear this prayer of Zechariah. And, and it goes on where it says, he was inspired by the spirit and he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he, meaning Simeon, took him in his arms and blessed God and said, this is what's read every night in the hours. Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all people, a light for the re revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of thy people Israel. So this is Simeon's prophecy in holding the child Jesus who was brought to the temple for this dedication. It's a beautiful, beautiful note. And again, it's the story about the Holy Spirit. And Father asked, why, why are we suddenly worried about the Holy Spirit? As the Holy Spirit's everywhere. He pointed out that, that Jesus was being depicted throughout all his infancy as the Messiah and, and one who was anointed. And again, in the Old Testament, that was always the king and the king was always anointed and the spirit of God was upon him. We saw that with Saul and then we saw that with David and then we saw it with the other kings. And then we're gonna see at Jesus' baptism, is when we're going to see the Holy Spirit coming down to anoint Jesus in the waters of the Jordan with John the Baptist. We'll actually, we'll start that when we get, we're going to look at Mark very briefly, and we'll see the baptism story there. But all of the Synoptic Gospels talk about the baptism of Jesus. Um, but everyone around Jesus at this point is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, that's in response to Jeremiah 31, 31, which is that wonderful statement, I'll take out your stony hearts and I'll replace you with flesh hearts and the law will be written in the flesh. The law written in the flesh, does that tell you anything? Incarnation, the coming of Jesus the Christ as God um, and he brings us the law, it's just tremendous. And we're gonna find St. Paul writing about it. Luke also has this idea that the gift of the spirit will not just be on the Messiah, but on all of God's people. And we're going to see Peter's speech, you know, in Act 2, when he professes the coming of the Messiah and all that has happened. And then the tongues of fire come down on the 12 apostles. All of this is its image of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And what does that do? I, this is what's really, to me, amazing, is that it fulfills a prophecy of Joel. And I, I was not that much aware of this prophecy. Joel, chapter uh, 2, verse 28 and 29 says, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even upon the maid, men servants and maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. That's from one of the Old Testament prophets, which we're seeing being fulfilled again in Luke's gospel, who expects us to know the prophecy of Joel. It's just another one of those. Two, uh, 28 to 29. Thank you. So Luke's telling us here that the Messiah comes, God's people will receive the spirit. And this happens because we are now part of the body of Christ. These words we hear all the time have this tremendous foundational structure. So it happens because God's, as I said, this is primarily a hint at what's going to happen at Pentecost, which we just mentioned, where the gifts come down and all those around about. And the apostles can basically be understood by all the languages of the world that were represented in those people. It's sort of a miracle of understanding. They were speaking most likely in Aramaic, and everyone there could understand their speaking in their language. Um, I think, I don't know. It could be that when they were speaking, it came out in everybody's language, I'm not sure, but it's all, God can do whatever he wants. I certainly didn't have to clear it with me. Okay, verse 27. Who knew there's this much stuff in here? Okay, I just read that one. That, this is the um, Zacharias pronouncement. Uh, this idea that um, the glory of God of Israel be upon you is a phrase that's used in the church liturgical service. Compline is night prayer. 
And Compline in the monastery uh, always closes with this, this phrase. And it's because it's the manifestation right in the middle of the liturgy that we're seeing the continuation of God among his people. So it's amazing how these phrases were used. 33 through 35, this is one we, we know the most about. So it says, again, Mary, his father and mother, Jesus' mother, father and mother marveled at what was said about him, meaning Jesus. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. Now think of hearing this. You're at this joyful moment. You're, you're complying with the law. You meet this very special guy who's making these great pronouncements about your baby. And then he says to you, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against and a sword will pierce through your soul also and thoughts and, and throughout of the many hearts may be revealed. So he is giving her, this is one of the seven dolors, the seven the sadnesses of Mary. There's a, I think there's a, I think you can do, forget there's a liturgy you can do. Now, there, isn't there a, um, an altar in the Basilica in Washington for the seven dollars? I think there is the seven sadnesses of Mary. But hey, this is one of those where she's forewarned. Now, what are we talking about? We all know. We know that this is her at the foot of the cross watching her son be executed by the Romans. This is the sword that pierces her heart. But all her life, she knew her relationship to what was coming for her son. So about this and that yeah, I would think it would be. So again, the source, this child be the source of revelation, and and all and and all people what will know what God's going to reveal them. And it's going to be this rise and fall of many nations. His mother feels this pain and she'll feel it even greater at the end. 36 to 40 said, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel of the tribe of Asher, and she was a, of a great age. I don't really consider this a great age. <laughs> um, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity and a widow until she was 84. Um, she's two years older than I am. And she did not depart from the temple, worship and fasting and prayer. So if you don't see me, I, that's it. I'm, I'll be in the temple fasting and praying 24 hours a day. And um, coming up at the very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke to him and to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee and their own city of Nazareth. That's interesting, because it seems like when we go back to Matthew, that suddenly the, the Magi appear, they're still in Bethlehem, they're waiting in the house. The Magi appear, and then they get the threat of Herod, and they go to Egypt. But it looks like here in Luke, they may have gone back to Nazareth for a while, but then why would they be in the house in Bethlehem when the Magi appear? I don't quite get it. But again, Matthew and Luke didn't really care whether we understood it or not. So anyway, we see this. Uh, Father also said that this this woman Anna might have been another of the temple virgins so you know there was that theory that there was a group of women that took care of these young children who were dedicated to the temple at a very early age she may have been among them we don't we just don't know father further Luke doesn't mention the wise men and he hasn't mentioned going to Egypt why because it wasn't important to him he was dealing with Gentiles Matthew this is very important the whole idea of going to Egypt coming out of Egypt the whole idea of all these things that are going on, the wise men coming. So you have the shepherds coming in Luke's got the poorest of the poor, and then the wealthy wise men, uh, uh, stargazers that came and brought great gifts. So we get the balance from the two. Um, again, Father suggests we put a note there Matthew to, to Matthew 2 that shows us how this continuation occurred. But most likely Luke wasn't trying to hide these events. Because John says in his end of his gospel that if everything that was said by Jesus written down, you couldn't contain them in all the books of the world. So each gospel had to pick and choose. Father, Father made an, an interesting observation. He said, if a couple goes on a trip, like, like Beverly and I went to the Holy Land, 
if if we came back and you separated us and and you ask each of us what was the highlight of the trip, we wouldn't say the same thing, most likely. Most likely one thing was important to me and one thing else would be important to Beverly. And he said, this is the exact same thing with these authors. They're writing very expensive process, very costly. They limited in how much they could spend and so on. And so they were very selective to put the stories they felt would appeal to their audience. Luke, Gentiles, converts. Matthew, Jewish converts. So we see a great deal of time uh, in Luke talking about shepherds and stables and trip uh, from, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And we hear about Cornelius and Caesar and all those kinds of things. And the author, again, picks this based on his audience. One point Luke wanted the audience to know was that the story of Hannah was being fulfilled here, which is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. She left her son with Eli, the, the, the prophet, and he grew up to be the prophet Samuel growing up in the temple, and he gets his calling there. We had a great story. So we look and suggest that both Matthew and Luke give us the full story. I'm going to go over just a minute because I think we can actually finish chapter two and then I'll have something else next week. So um, in chapter it, uh, verse 41, said, now the parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast. This is the unique to Luke. This is the story of Jesus when he's 12 years old. So his nativity story ends right here. And then he picks up with the story 12 when he's 12 years old. Parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom and the feast was ending. They were returning the boy. Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents did not know it, but supposed him to be in a company. They went on a day's journey. He was at that age where the, the boy could be with one or the other. Before that, he had to be with the mother. After that, he would be with the father. So I can just see this conversation. Let's say they got all the way to Jericho, 2,200 feet down from Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, hey, Mary, uh, is Jesus with you? Uh, no, dear. I thought he was with you. Uh, no, he's not with me. We lost a child in the store for about five minutes and thought the world had come to an end. He said, they went on a day's journey and they saw him among their kinsmen and, they, and, uh, and acquaintances and they did not find him. And they returned to Jerusalem. Probably had to wait till the next morning. You're not going to go up from Jericho to Jerusalem at night. Seeking him. And after three days, they found him in the temple. Sitting among the teachers. Listening to them and asking, asking them questions. The 12-year-old boy. And they heard and were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, Mary and Joseph... They were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why did you treat us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, he's a teenage boy, right? Oh, how is it that you looked for, sought me? Did you not know that I'd be in my father's house? <laughs> Mom, are you really? And they did not understand the saying, and they spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept these things in her heart. We heard that just a while ago. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and man. So we'll quickly look at these last ones and be finished with them. So we see um, this, they're trying to live up this expectation of the law prescribing uh, the annual feast where they had to go down Passover booths and Pentecost. So they were down on a normal time. Mary and Joseph live relatively close to Jerusalem. They could get there in five or six days. And we think Jesus was 12. Father pointed out a detailed description of the parallel stories in the four gospels and this visit to Jerusalem. Um, there are lots of five parallel stories between Matthew and Luke. There are many parallels between Luke and John more than any other because Luke's gospel is probably written based on the information at Ephesus where John was. And most likely, John came to Ephesus sometime near the end of the 80s and 90s after he fled from Jerusalem. So we're probably seeing the influence of Luke on John and vice versa. John describes three Passovers, and that's where we get the idea that it was three-year ministry. Okay, um, Father pointed out that when Jesus was asked questions by using, this was a style of dialogue. He wasn't asking questions to get information. That's the way you shared information. So... This is a common practice. After the Pharisees ask him why his disciples ate meals without properly washing beforehand, which is later in the gospel, and Jesus doesn't respond because 
he's asked them why they take their tradition over the teaching of the law. So he's questioning them. So it's that's the way they dialogue. The crowd asked Jesus if he was the Messiah, and he responded, I will answer if you answer my question. Was the baptism of John on earth or from heaven? So this is the way the style. So he was discussing the scripture with these great scholars at the time at 12. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king? And he said, uh, uh, he asked Pilate, are you saying this on your own accord? Or did somebody else tell you? He didn't answer. Yes, I'm the king. So this is the way we hear someone ask Jesus a question. He responds with a question. And it doesn't mean he's seeking information, but giving a teaching. And then we see Father indicate that Jews were listening to Jesus and not asking questions, seeking answers. Again, these were the teachers of the law. And he was 12. Um, he certainly was more than the adopted son of Joseph. He was the human and divine king. At the end of the story, Luke finished with Hannah, the image of Samuel. Again, we can see the references uh, to the priesthood of Samuel and Eli and the line of Aaron. And, and now we see that Luke ends this um, with something very important to Paul that he talks about in the epistle of the Hebrews. And finally, Paul proclaims that the Levitical priesthood is failing and we'll have a new priest order, a priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. That's why today our priests are not in the line of Aaron. They're from the community at large. And Father suggests that Luke is ending this passage in this manner. And he is saying that Jesus um, was left just as Hannah left her son Samuel. And that's the way Luke ends it. So we're going to conclude this with the infancy narrative. Next week, we'll look at a brief orientation on the gospel of Mark. And then we'll be getting to look at one or two chapters in Mark. And then we'll come back and start looking at the stories in Matthew. So went over a little bit, but I wanted to get that done. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed are the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Glorious St. Raymond of Pinafore, wise and holy patron, come to the aid of those entrusted to your care, and to all who flee to your protection. Intercede for us in our need. Help us through your prayers, example, and teaching to proclaim the truth of the gospel to all we meet. When we have reached the fullness of our years, we beseech you to guide us home to heaven to live in peace with you, our Mother Mary, and with Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much. We'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you so much, Bob. God bless you. Thank you.